Hey everybody, I'm Jenny Hadfield, also known as Coach Jenny. Welcome to the running class, the seven most common lawn run mistakes and how to avoid them. This is the second running class in a series for the Cleveland Marathon, Half Marathon, 10K, and 5K. And if you missed the first one, the secrets of a successful training season, you can find it in the training section on the clevelandmarathon.com website. Remember, if you have any training questions along the way this season, I'm happy to answer them. In fact, I'm on the Cleveland Marathon Facebook page every Tuesday to do so. So if you've got questions, post them there and I can answer them. You can also download this running class and the first one in MP3 format so you can listen while you're training. And who knows, you just may prevent some of these mistakes on your next run. So here we go. Giddy up. And long run mistake number one, running too far too soon. It's an easy, really easy trap to get caught up in, especially if this is your first time doing an endurance event uh, or even 5K or 10K. Um, what happens when you're training for endurance long runs is on a typical schedule, you'll see a progression, t usually about a mile, uh, 10 or 15 minutes more or longer than what your current fitness level is. And so that is designed in a recipe to allow your body to go just a little bit further every week, but not so far that you're running well beyond your endurance fitness and which can cause injury. So if you start jumping to catch up, let's say you got hurt or you're traveling and you missed a couple of long runs and now you want to catch up to that schedule and you start jumping forward in distance or you, you want to appease the, the nervousness that's going on in your head because you're worried about not running the distance before you actually run the race distance. You start jumping ahead more and by leaps and bounds, two, three, four miles at a pop. When you do that, you appease your mind. So you calm your nerves, but you really place a lot of risk on your muscles, tendons, joints that are all used to going that shorter distance. So Make sure you want to avoid doing that. You want to avoid running too far too soon because that you may not feel that in the first week or the second week or the third week, but at some point that stress accumulates and it catches up with you and can cause burnout. It can cause a decrease in slowing in performance and it can cause injuries for sure. I see it over and over again. So make sure you're progressing. Even if it means coming in with less miles under your belt for race day, you're better off doing that than to jump up in miles or to go too far too soon. Long run mistake number two is running too fast. And as you can see on the picture, there's a turtle on the road and that's exactly how you should feel when you're doing your long, slow endurance runs. The difference between running for fitness and training for a race is that when you run for fitness, it's consistent week to week. You're doing very similar workouts. There's not a huge progression in distance or effort. And when you train for a race, your progression, your training is progressing throughout the season. So you're running longer, you're running faster in many cases, and it, there's a progression. There's an increase in volume and or intensity, depending on what program you're following. So because of this progression, it's really important to vary your effort level throughout all the workouts as you train so that your body can kind of ebb and flow through the demands and the stresses of training harder and rest and cross training to recover. If you're continue to train at the same pace, um, at the same speed and the same gear over and over again, that you might be able to get away with when you're running for fitness on down the road, you're, you're going to set yourself up for an injury and burnout. So you want to make sure that you're running at a, what I call a conversational or a happy effort or zone. I call it the yellow zone. Think of the happy face. If you can't hold a conversation, if you can't talk out loud, if you're running alone, say the Pledge of Allegiance out, out loud. And if you're having a hard time getting that out all the way through to the end, really comfortably, if you can't do it comfortably, you're running too fast, slow it down. Avoid trying to run the long runs by a target time. I'm going to finish this by 10 o'clock in two hours today. 
This sets you up for the race pace training disaster where you feel great for about three to six weeks in the initial parts of your training, but then things start to really crumble when your energy levels decline, your body starts to ache and your performance begins to suffer. This is because you're running those long runs too fast and what might have felt great early in the season is now really beginning to wear on you because there's an accumulated stress effect because of all the ingredients of that training program. So slow it down, run at your talkative, happy, happy pace. Your body will recover uh, a lot more efficiently. You'll be able to train with better quality in the next couple of days and down the road. Run slowly, run efficiently, think like the turtle. Long run mistake number three is running by pace rather than your effort. The easiest way to bonk during a long run and sometimes even a race is to run it by a pace. Pace is the outcome. Your body doesn't know pace, it knows effort. It's not the target of your long run. When you run by feel, that effort level, that happy zone that I was just talking about, and stick with a conversational pace like effort, you'll always be in the right zone on the given day. And it, it's going to vary, folks. And this is, it drives me crazy when I see programs that say run two minutes slower than your projected marathon time because it's insane. <laughs> Quite frankly, how A, if you're a first timer, how the heck do you know what your planned marathon time is three months ahead of time? It's just silly. And B, it's not about pace. It's about training at the right effort zone. Okay. And a really good example. Let's say you're going to go out and do your long run tomorrow morning. You get out there, you're doing eight miles for the first time in your life. The longest you've ever done is seven. It's a big day for you. And there are 20 mile an hour winds and they're all headwinds. Okay. When you start to run into a headwind that that's that strong, your normal, easy pace that may be 10 minutes is now going to turn into a 1030 or a 1045, or maybe even 11 because you're running farther than you ever have before. So that's the number one reason, because if you get out there and you say, okay, I'm going to follow my watch. I'm going to run by pace because my two minutes slower than my planned, you know, fictional marathon pace and half marathon pace in May is 10 minutes or what have you, you're putting yourself in the red zone. There's yellow zone, there's orange zone, there's red zone. Yellow zone is easy conversational effort. That's aerobic running. There's orange zone that's moderate where you start to hear your breathing. That's right at your, just below your red line, right where your body starts to really tap into using glycogen that's stored in your muscles and in your body uh, to, to help you move more quickly. Okay. That's the red line. And so when you cross from orange to red, now you're burning through those glycogen stores at a rapid rate. You're no longer in the aerobic zone per se, and it's a lot harder. And you know, it's a lot harder because you're breathing a lot harder. Your heart rate's higher. Now, all of a sudden you're out there running your normal pace, but it's 20 mile an hour headwinds. You're having to work that much harder in that, in those conditions, right? So that's why pace doesn't work, folks. You, you get out there on the same, the next week, it's perfect weather and the exact opposite could happen. Now, all of a sudden, because you've been smart and training by your body, your body has adjusted and adapted and gotten better than it was during week one. So now you might on a nice cool day with a little bit of a tailwind, you might be able to run a little bit faster on that day. But if you're stuck or caught on that watch, you're, you're never going to know what the exact zone is and you're not going to be training as optimally as if you just tune into your body. It's really, really simple, really simple. It's so simple. Nobody wants to follow it that way. So keep it simple. Um, let your body be the guide and let all the variables that can affect your performance in a long run or even race day, like sleep, stress, nutrition, uh, your training fatigue, your life fatigue, all those things can come into play. But when you start to ebb and flow, uh, through your training season and truly tune into your body and run at that easy conversational effort, guess what? Your body adapts, it recovers more quickly, and you're able to get on with that next workout. And you're able to actually train in the exact zone you need to. So your body is learning how to tap into fat as a primary resource uh, for fuel, which is really going to help you on race day. So think about the pace being the outcome of that day 
And you're going to have days where it's a lot slower and days where it's faster than you expect. Um, But let that be the outcome, not the guide. Let your body be the guide. Long run mistake number four is running too many long runs back to back. And what I mean by back to back is on consecutive weeks. So where you do eight miles, nine miles, 10 miles, 11 miles, 12 miles, 13 miles, and there's no cutback at all. Cutback weeks, if you look at a typical schedule, they happen usually in my schedule, they they happen early on every two to three weeks. And then later in the season, when you're running your longest miles, I'll do it every other week. Um, This works really well for for newbies to the distance. It works really well for folks that are uh, have done the distance before works well for athletes that are a little bit older because it helps you recover Um, and even seasoned runners because you can use those cutback weeks as race simulation weeks. So the the point here is uh, you can get caught up in the numbers game and running lots of long runs without abbing and flowing through uh, cutback or recovery uh, long runs down the road is going to end up really hampering your adaptation and uh, how your body is performing. It can help, it can reduce your your performance in terms of showing up in fatigue, not sleeping, insomnia, general overtraining uh, symptoms, uh, aches and pains, niggling aches and pains where your body just doesn't have enough time to recover. So you want to make sure that you're a following a training plan that has cutback weeks in it, b not allowing yourself to train continually where you're progressing in a nonstop uh, progression rate. And usually, again, again for first timers, if you give yourself a long enough runway, um, you can plug in when you start to get beyond the the longer distances for a half marathon. That would be anywhere from eight to ten miles, and for a marathon, you're looking at anything over 14, 15 miles, you can alter that with a cutback week in between. So if you do uh, 15 miles this weekend, then you can do for a marathon, or you could do eight to 10 the following week, and then go 16 miles the following weekend, and then an eight to 10 cutback week the following. What this does is A, it gives your life uh, a a break, so you're not continuing to hammer long workouts, gives your body a break, uh, gives you some flexibility, Um, and it's not a a long run on, uh, season. It really is a beneficial tool. Uh, traditionally marathon and half marathon training schedules didn't go this way. I actually started creating endurance long run schedules this way, where you're adding a few more cutback weeks in, uh, because I was recognizing and noticing that a people really liked it better because they weren't hammering out or having to do those long runs every single week. Um, it fit into their lifestyles a lot better, but B, they were able to get in better quality over time. It just requires a little more time in terms of a runway in, in your prep, but if you've got it, take it. And if you don't have it, just be really cautious and remember you don't necessarily have to get in the optimal amount of long distance miles to race well on, on uh, race day. Sometimes going beyond that can hurt you on race day. So make sure that you're not going on and on and on, run on long runs, Uh, avoid them at all costs. Long run mistake number five is running too many miles. This goes out to the folks, including myself when I was a newbie at this, who want to train the race distance. um, And they haven't because they haven't done the distance before. Those that think, uh, or that are troubled Uh, by nerves of running a 10 miler for their longest run before a 13 mile race, 13.1 mile race, or 20 miles before a marathon distance race. And what happens with that is when you start to run more long run miles or too many long run miles, it has a fatiguing effect on your body. It extends the length of your training season because now you've got to do If you're doing a 20 and you're going up to 26, you've got to do a 21 and a 22 and a 24 and yada, yada, yada. So now you're all of a sudden adding four more long runs, which adds more to the amount of stress on your body, which takes away from the quality that you can do in the other workouts, which takes away from the balance of the quality of your training. And every runner, uh, there are a handful of people that can, I used to train with a buddy of mine, Mark, who could run 
like Forrest Gump and not have an injury in the world. He could run 30 miles before a marathon uh, without a problem. And But he's the exception to the rule, for sure. In my years of coaching, the the more miles people tend to do and put on their body, the less it tends to help them on race day. There's a balance, um, folks, and it really makes a significant difference in the quality of your recovery and the quality of your training and the, eventually the quality of your performance. So don't think about the miles. Don't think about the volume of the miles along the way um, or the how far you go. Think about the quality. And if you're a first-timer, 10 miles is plenty to get you through that half marathon because you're also doing nine, eight, seven, and so on. Uh, marathoners, 20 miles is plenty, especially if you're a first timer, you can start experimenting after that first time, but 20 is plenty. But avoid getting into the trap of trying to go farther and putting too many miles under your belt because it's going to have a negative consequence down the road. Long run mistake number six is playing long run catch up. This is a tough one. Because if you, let's say, get sick, you get the flu, and you end up missing 10 days of training, which is devastating mentally and emotionally, and you want to get back into that training plan, the instinct typically is to get back into that training plan. Let's say you're following one of my training plans on the, on the website, and you miss 10 days, and now you want to get caught back up. It, it, it's a very normal, rational thought, but it doesn't work that way. If you miss 10, if you miss one or two days, absolutely. If you miss 10 days and you are sick, flat on your back with a flu, that's a whole nother season. And now you have to reframe your head to think, okay, now I'm going with plan B. I was following plan A. Now I'm following plan B because the training plan is a blueprint that's going to evolve and change as you progress through the season. And so if you get sick, you're on vacation, you missed, whether it's work, whatever, you can't merge back into that same plan unless it's just a couple of days. You've got to make sure that you're not playing the mad game of catch up because when you do that now, if you take the example of sickness, you're coming back into that training compromised because you've, you've been flat on your back and you're also trying to, trying to jump into that 16 mile run or that 14 mile run and your body's not going to be able to handle it. So you're going to set yourself up for a relapse of either illness or an ache or a pain or an injury. So you want to avoid getting caught up in that plan and flow from where you are. When you miss a week due to illness and you're coming back from illness, you want to make sure you pick the best route, which is usually just weaving in some shorter runs, 20 to 30 minute shorter ones to remind your body that you're a runner, to remind your body that you're training. And from there, you build back up in mileage, in time, keeping that effort nice and easy. And you return for that week, you get your body back into running its running state, and then you can develop a program from there. If this happens to happen to you along the way, remember to to post a question to me, I can help you get back into your training season. But you do not want to catch up in that situation. You want to make sure you merge your way back into it and then recreate a plan B for that training season. You want to give your body plenty of time to get back into the swing of things rather than catch up. Remember, your training plan is a work of progress. Let it flow naturally with the rhythm of your life. Good or bad, it's going to be the best uh, for performance on race day. And finally, long run mistake number seven, feeling with too much sugar or none at all. Now, sports drinks and other on the run, quick energy fueling products such as gels or beans or blocks were originally invented to supplement your energy intake on the run. Your body can take in only so much energy uh, in the form of uh, sugar uh, especially when you're running because of the movement of, of the running motion, your stomach is literally jostling up and down and all everything that's inside of your stomach is also jostling up and down. Um, and it can cause if you get too much in there, too much sugar or too many mixtures of things, um, it can really cause what I call sugar belly or nauseousness or stomach upset, which is not fun when you're training or racing. And the idea is to not replace the energy that you're losing while you're running, not to replace the calories that you're burning, but to replenish a percentage of what is lost, to offset that deficit. Because it's impossible for you to replace the amount of fluid and energy that you're lo losing or burning while you're running, especially when you're racing. 
And I believe also this is lost in the marketing translation of all these products as well. So you've got to keep that in mind. Create your own recipe. Everybody's going to have their own unique menu for fueling on the go. Some go with sports drink only as it contains uh, sugar and electrolytes and fluid. And it's a really convenient way to go because everything's in that one package. And you can kind of moderate the intensity of or the concentration of that as you go. So other people go with sports drinks plus a gel along the way. The traditional model was to have that sports drink in a marathon and then to supplement it later in the race at mile 18, 19, when your glycogen stores tend to run a little bit lower, to, to have a gel just to kind of to offset that. And now that's turned into having a gel every 30 minutes. So you just want to make sure you're not combining that concept with the sports drink concept as well. Still, others will go with the simplicity of water. I use water when I do ultras just because I know what I'm getting. Um, it's not going to change or modify. I don't have to carry powders with me. Um, if you do that, then you've got to supplement with an, an electrolyte tab um, or a pill. Um, you know, there's gels out there that have electrolytes as well. Um, you can, if you're using water, you can use gels as that energy then, or you can use um, more natural products, which aren't as convenient, raisins, pitted dates, that kind of thing. Are you confused yet? <laughs> you should be. Um, endurance, you know, fueling for endurance has become quite intimidating, almost as intimidating as the cereal aisle at the grocery store, I think. So the, the goal is to keep it simple and to target, um, what the general range of carbohydrates for an endurance athlete is 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour for runs that are lasting longer than 60 minutes. So if you look at those gels, if you look at the sports drink, you can kind of develop a recipe based on how much carbohydrates you're taking in and kind of follow along what that standard is. Like if you look at a per particular gel, it might have 25 or 30 grams of carbohydrate. Someone might be fine. Someone who weighs 120 pounds, 130 pounds might be fine with taking a gel and water. If the gel has electrolytes in it, then that could be their menu. Um, someone else who weighs 190 pounds, who's going to be burning through the calories a little bit more, they might need to lean more towards the 60 grams of carbohydrates or more. So the, the idea is to keep it simple, to, to interject or add or weave in these products one at a time to see if individually they work on their own in your system. And then from there, you can create uh, what your recipe is, whether you want to mix a sports drink and a, a gel later in a marathon. Uh, just keep in mind when you do that, let's say you're going to take a gel at mile 18. You want to make sure the aid station before you take that gel, you take water, not sports drink. When you take the gel at 18, or whenever you take it later in the season, wash or season in the, in the race, wash it down or dilute it with water. So you're not adding to the sugar content of that gel product because all of those products, whether it's sports drink or gels or blocks are made at about a six to 7% sugar concentration so that they can more readily get absorbed into your system. If you start adding to that by taking in a sports drink and a gel at the same time, it's going to sit in your belly a little bit longer and can cause you some problems. Not to mention there's two, lots of different forms of sugars that can cause the problem as well. So keep that in mind. Stick to that the, the general rule of thumb in terms of how much carbohydrate per hour and start to create your own recipe based on the sugars that, that are going to work for you and work in, in the timing of it in your system. So if you aim for that hourly rate, it gives you some kind of gauge on how to create your recipe. Keep track of this in your log, folks. Keep track of what works for you, what doesn't work for you, because then along the way, you'll create that recipe and uh, you'll have a, a, a good fueling system that's not going to cause you stomach upset on race day. So there you have it, the seven most common long run mistakes and how to avoid them. Good luck with your training this season. And again, if you have any questions, meet me on Facebook every Tuesday, and I'd be happy to answer them. Happy trails.